today we're gonna to look at James chapter four. And I titled this lesson, How Are Christians Tempted to Live? Have you ever wondered why it is so hard to live what you know? We've studied scripture, a lot of us, for decades now. Why is it that we can't just seem to get it right? Thankfully, Paul left us the answer to that in Romans chapter seven. This is one of my favorite passages in all of the whole Bible. Why is living this Christian life such a challenge? Even the apostle Paul said, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me. What a wretched man I am. That's Romans chapter 7, verses 18 to 23. It should give us all a sigh of relief to know that if the Apostle Paul could write those words, we can understand that's going to be a very real part of most of our lives as well. Now let's face it, Paul was a passionate disciple. He was an apostle that didn't live hot or cold. He was full blown uh, in everything that he did. But nevertheless, it is always going to be a problem in our Christian life. And sadly, it's even a problem among fellow Christians that we have troubles. We have problems getting along sometimes. We have problems liking each other. I've said sometimes, you know, I can love my fellow Christian, but I have a hard time liking some of them. That's just the honest truth about how we feel. There's some people whose personalities we just don't mesh well with. But in this chapter of the book of James, James goes to why that is true. What motivates us to sin and to use words we shouldn't have used or to treat people like we know we're not supposed to treat them. He begins chapter four saying, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Wrapped up in those verses are the roots of what causes pretty much every quarrel among Christian brothers and sisters. And I want to define what it means to covet. We don't get that word right sometimes. The word covet is not just to want something someone else has. The word covet means to want what someone has instead of them having it. That's to truly understand what's at the basis of what James is talking about. What causes our fights and quarrels it's our own desires. And these desires battle within us to underestimate the war zone that exists in every life between what God wants for us and what we want for ourselves is to fall into a pit of quarreling and fighting and feeling less than most of the time. We fail when we want something God doesn't want for our lives. We fail when we are willing to sacrifice what God wants for something we want. And we fail when we want things 
someone else has. And we quarrel and fight and battle because we don't want them to have it instead of us. So why is it then that we can pray to God and not receive the answers that we want? Are we praying for something God doesn't want us to have? Or are we praying with wrong motives? There is a difference between the life that is controlled by the person and the life that is controlled by God's Spirit. Remember what James has already said about submitting to that bit that is placed in the mouth. It's taking all your strength, all of who you are, and submitting all of that to the control of God's Holy Spirit. A life controlled by God's Spirit is a life that has to be lived daily, moment to moment, with the help of God. In verse 4, James describes the recipients of this letter in this way. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? That is a powerful message and always has been. He says, when you want what the world has, when you want what people in the world are able to achieve however they achieve it, we commit adultery against the one who loves us most. We sometimes want to be friends with a world that is not God's friend. And there's been theology compromised. There's been witness that has been compromised. There's been love that has been compromised in an effort to gain the respect, admiration, or influence of the world. That's why James continues saying, therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It's that last lesson where he said, from our mouth or from a spring, we can't get both fresh water and salt water. It's one or the other. Our witness either exudes the witness of God or the witness of this world. James goes on to say, do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? You want to know what God is passionate about for your life? It's all of those things this Holy Spirit wants to do through you. He jealously longs for the Holy Spirit to be loved as much as we love the world. And that's a hard one, isn't it? More than we love the world. That's why he caused the Spirit to dwell in us so that we could know every day, 24-7, that we are loved and that we are strengthened and that we have his presence in our life. So in verse 6, he says, he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. God will oppose our arrogance. God will oppose anything that hinders us from knowing him and helping others know him. So what's the answer? Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. 
Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Those verses, verses 7 to 10, define what a spirit-controlled life is. It's a life that is submitted to God. It is a life that is ready for battle because resisting the devil isn't easy. And he will come at you when you least expect it. If he's not coming at you, it means you're probably not messing with his plan very much. I love the illustration where the man uh, runs to hide behind a preacher. And he says, quick, hide me, the devil's after me. And the preacher looks at him and says, no, the devil's got you, it's me he's after. If you've signed on to be a spirit-led Christian, if that is the goal of your life, then when next time you pass a mirror, look in it and realize you have a huge target painted on you and you should know it, you should be kind of proud if the devil comes after you. But here's what's necessary. If you want to resist the devil, you have to draw near to God. You have to lean into him, knowing he is your strength for the battle. Why? Because you draw near to God and he promises to draw near to you. Wash your hands of your sins. It's like that verse we talked about before, throw off those filthy garments. Because we are sinners. We do get dirty walking through this world. And we're to purify our hearts. How do we purify them? We get rid of all of the thoughts that aren't of God. We're double-minded if we think like the world and like God's word teaches us to think. We need to grieve, mourn, and wail. Never forget that the beatitude that said, blessed are those who mourn, literally means blessed are those who grieve and mourn whatever separates them from their holy God. We should not just feel sorry about the things we do wrong. We should grieve that we've done something that separated us from God. That's when we can change our laughter, things that we think are funny, into mourning and our joy to gloom. We can change those things that we thought we found happiness in in order to truly find God's happiness. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Claw your way to the bottom so that he can lift you up. That's the definition James gives for what it means to live a holy life. In verse 11, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? There is such a difference between judgment and discernment. God has given us the Holy Spirit to help us notice sin in a person's life. The mistake we make is that when we notice the sin, we sometimes think that's permission to pass judgment on it, and it is not. We aren't able to understand and judge like God. So when you notice sin in someone's life, what do we do? Ignore it? Probably not. 
What we are called to do is pray for God's words of wisdom, pray for God's grace, pray for the words God wants that person to know. Not that they are judged for that sin, but that there is a way they can live free of it. It isn't about what we know. It's about what we do with what we know that is our wisdom. And again, in verse 13, James says, now listen. Whenever he says that, take a breath and pay close attention. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That's your devotional thought for the day, isn't it? We are a mist. The best way to understand what these words mean is to see them from a first century mindset. James says, listen, you make plans. They had to make plans. To travel to another city required them to gather food, gather water, find a way to make it there, travel at the just the right time so that they would feel like they could make it. And they would do that planning to spend a year there. If they went to all the trouble to travel, they might be gone for quite a while. It was important to plan. But he says, listen, all of you who plan your life down to the nth detail in order so you can carry on business and make money. Why do you even plan for that? Because you don't even know what will happen. Don't count on those plans is what James is saying because you don't know what will happen tomorrow. Our lives are brief. Nobody reaches their 80th birthday and says, boy, it took a long time to get here. It always seems to pass quickly. It's just that these earthly lives are short. We have a brief time to live for the Lord before we do live with him. So, We should live with an eternal perspective, James says, not about planning all of our daily moments, but about taking what is necessary to plan for our eternity. How much time do we spend making sure we are storing treasure in heaven? How much effort do you give to your heavenly reward? That's why he says, instead of making all those earthly plans, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This passage is so weighty. I could spend a lot of time. There are main points in this passage. The key to living God's will, the key to living God's reward, the key to not being bogged down with arrogant schemes is to realize what God wants us to say what God wants us to do. We ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. Never let our earthly plans take precedence over what God has said we need to accomplish. When I was raising my boys and there was a tough decision to be made, like which college they would go to, the question was, Which place, which decision is going to enable you to best walk with God, to best accomplish God's plan for your life? There are schools that 
are going to produce the best education for this or that. But what if your child's spouse is at that school over there? What if the direction God wants to provide is through a person at another place? Don't boast in what your own thinking can accomplish. Instead, know what is good. Know what God says you ought to do and do that. Because what is a sin? How do we define a sin in our life? It is in verse 17. A sin is knowing what we ought to do and choosing to do something else. Our plans are often about what we want. And maybe we never even stopped to ask God if it's what he wants for us. None of us ever achieve God's perfect plan. But if we will hear James' words here, if we will value James' words here, if we will make every effort to resist Satan's schemes, which are absolutely an attempt to keep us from God's plan. If we will do that, we have a much better chance of living the life God wants for our lives. There is a continuous permanent truth in God's word. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We should pray for God's kingdom, God's control. We should pray that God's will is done on earth, just like it's done in heaven. And we should pray that that happens through our lives. Later in Romans, Paul would write, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Because then you can test and approve. You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And we can never forget that that lesson follows the words to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is your spiritual act of worship. We are taught in scripture to lay down these lives in order to live for God. And so I close with some wisdom on this very topic. The first from Frederick Faber, there are no disappointments to those whose wills are buried in the will of God. If in this moment you realize you're disappointed with some things in your life or some choices you've made, there's great hope. You can't go back and undo the past, but you can learn from it. And there is no disappointments to those whose wills are buried in the will of God. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher, said, the great maker of the will is alive to carry out its own intentions. God will create in you his will. All we need do is want it for ourselves. And another quote from Mother Teresa, God gives when he will, as he will, to whom he will. So to know God's will, you have to know God. You have to know his will for your life is perfection. God's not capable of anything less. His will is always going to be for our greatest good. His will is not changed, only hindered by our own. His will 
is the continuous, biblical, pure truth of who God is from Genesis through the book of Revelation. And God's will is what we want to want, even when we don't want it. In other words, you want God's will. When you know it's God's will, lay down what you think you want, because it isn't what you want. That's why he taught us to pray, thy will be done. I hope these words sprout in all of our lives and produce the desire in us to walk with him more closely than we ever have before. We need to pray right now that God's will would be done on earth just like it is in heaven. See you next time.